The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. It is now my honor to welcome back uh, uh, Tom Pendergrass, the chairman and CEO of the MTA. Uh, it was at an Abbey breakfast last April that the governor uh, stood at this podium and announced that uh, he would reappoint uh, Chairman Pendergrass. And I looked at Tom's expression. He was uh, obviously very pleased and I think surprised uh, for another six-year term. And uh, it is a testament to his uh, outstanding job as the chairman and what he is doing at the helm of the MTA. Uh, since uh, Tom last addressed Abney, uh, we know that they've been working hard uh, to keep up with the city's ever-increasing ridership and job growth. I think uh, uh, in 2014, we added over 100,000 jobs, and in 2015, over another 100,000 jobs. Um, and I think the, uh, and we all know that uh, transportation is the lifeblood of our city, and I think they are working very hard to keep up with this growing demand uh, all over the city and obviously uh, with uh, Metro North um, and Long Island Railroad. Uh, they are, you know, I think came through with flying colors during the terrible storm uh, and with the opening of the new seven line extension Hudson Yards. Uh, and also uh, the uh, rolling out and over 278 underground subway stations uh, Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, the opening at the end of this year of 2nd Avenue subway, and then just recently this week, uh, Tom and the governor announced uh, the rollout of thousands of new city buses equipped with USB uh, charging ports, Wi-Fi, and L, uh, LCD information screens over the next several years. Tom, I think I speak for all New Yorkers when I say uh, thank you for your continuing leadership uh, and exceptional service uh, for our city and looking forward in terms of capital projects to make sure that New York City squarely uh, remains uh, the uh, great city that it is. And uh, we welcome you back to Abney. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman Tom Pendergrass. Good morning, everyone. On what is not quite officially a spring day, we certainly will have weather today to complement it being a spring day. I think we're going to have temperatures in the 70s. And we've had a relatively mild winter. If you compare this to last winter, we had a number of snowstorms and ice storms, and uh, ice storms do not go well with electric railroads. Uh, we did have a very big snowfall, I think the second or third largest in New York City's history. Uh, and I think Bill did talk about uh, underscoring the importance of the MTA network to enable people to get around even in times of storms. Uh, this is not an oxymoronic statement. I, I go to places and I talk about bringing the MTA into the 21st century, and they look at their watch and they go, it's 2016, we're in the 21st century. So in anticipation of a question you may have in the back of your mind, I will tell you for someone who spent the majority of his 40-year career in the New York City and MTA system, uh, for a system that was ahead of its time at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, technology wasn't even a word in the dictionary probably. And where we stand today in terms of the challenges that it presents to us to put new technology into a system that was designed and built when it was, is, is quite a foreboding challenge for us. But it's one we must meet because an increasing number of our customers hold those technology improvements as expectations, not niceties. That's what this slide is talking about. And I want to go through today how our paradigm needs to shift as the operators and providers of the asset and the services we have to meet these challenging needs. Uh, population in New York continues to grow. We expect to see another million people in the region by 2030, uh, a million people in the city by 2035, another million people in the region on top of that. And our 
ridership base is changing. I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1952, and the overwhelming majority of my career were catering to the populace and users of the system who were baby boomers, and that's now changing to millennials, people that were born after 1980. And their wants, needs, and demands are different. They don't have memories of the decrepit state that the system was in back in 1980, so they don't even think they're going to allow us to go to that level. If you're my age and you remember what it was, a state of good repair message is something that resonates with you, but for you know boomers, it doesn't resonate with them because their expectations is don't you dare let it go back to that level again. 22% uh, of the regional population are millennials born after 1980. They're entering the labor force, and they're entering the labor force in a different way than people of my generation did. Uh, they do have a desire to live in urban settings. When I was graduating, people would start in an urban setting but quickly transition to a suburban setting and start a family and use the transportation network to and from the city as their means of getting around. And they were pretty much, you know, work of our nine to five type people. Um, but the millennials are actually buying cars later in life, getting married later in life, and they're experiencing an urban lifestyle that New York probably has one of the best cities in North America to offer, and they're tech savvy. The boomers are changing. I mean, a lot of people in, in, in my uh, generation, when they retired, they went to the warmer climes of the Carolinas or Florida or Arizona, but more and more people are staying here to be closer to their families, and they're actually reverting to lifestyles where they can live, maybe not necessarily in an urban environment, but a suburban environment that has transitory development and they can get around uh, on the public transportation that sits here. Um, they're becoming more and more dependent on transit. That's a challenge for us because as you get older, you become less mobile, whether or not you are truly inhibited and you need to get around with a device. Uh, your ability to tr you know, uh, accommodate the vertical challenges our system have uh, need to be addressed. So we need more escalators, elevators, and access to some of the stations we have, and more off-peak travel because they're using the system to get around for social and other reals reasons. We've truly come to a 24-7, 365-day-a-year society. There are non-traditional work patterns. There are many people that are entering the workforce today that don't work full five days in the CBD. They work three or four days. They telecommute other days. They travel to other parts of the region. And they're moving away from what we used to traditionally call the fire, finance, insurance, and real estate jobs, to more of the social service jobs that the population at large needs to be able to accommodate. Uh, the peak rush hour travel growth has slowed. We've seen, when I left Senior Vice President of Subways in 1994, we were carrying 3.5 million people a day. We're now carrying 5.9 to 6 million people a day on the subway. And that growth has occurred in the middle of the day, weekends and nights, where we have capacity. And the suburban employment has grown, and people actually going from one suburban entity to another to uh, access employment or from the city to access employment in the suburbs, like White Plains and New Haven and uh, Stamford are examples of the reverse peak on Metro North that we need to actually replicate in Long Island. Um, as I said, the dominance of tech, education, and healthcare sectors is growing, and, and more and more people uh, are coming to and utilizing New York. I think I heard on the radio today, they expect 70 million visitors to New York next year. I think the goal was you know, 60, 65, and they had 68. 70 million people coming to an experience in New York way of life, a New York City experience. When I was born and raised in Chicago, it was like, you went to New York, but you went to New York with a lot of foreboding fear. Uh, that's not the case today. People are comfortable, people are secure, people get around, and they love to come to New York. What does this mean to us? Our monthly ticket sales on the railroads are trending down. Those are the people that own a monthly ticket to travel in the morning and home in the evening. But our individual ticket sales are growing. And that's a direct correlation with the lesser number of people that are Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and more 24-7, some days of the week in the city, some days of the week someplace else, but also, more importantly, trips for social purposes, entertainment purposes. It all adds up to a continued growth in population. I think this is the, one of the longest, strongest runs of the market. Uh, hard to believe. I mean, one thing I know, I was born and raised in a second city, but New York generally enters the, the recessions uh, first and comes out late. But we, we're kind of a couple years into something when we're out and we finally realize, hey, we're out of this. But this is a long run of a healthy market, and there's a continued employment growth in the region that is straining our system. I could not emphasize that more importantly, straining our system, because we're carrying more people than we have capacity to add. If you're a regular rider on the Lexington Avenue line, it's more likely than not you're not getting on the first or second train, you're getting on the third train or the fourth train in the peak of the rush hour. 
And that's an example of that strained capacity. And we expect that growth to continue. What's the solution? Yes, we need to have money. We'll talk a little bit about that. But we need to be able to spend that money wisely, effectively, efficiently, and quickly. Not foolishly, but quickly. So we need to build projects and deliver them faster and more efficiently and actually step outside of the bounds that we have operated in for the majority of the MTA's existence. What's our plan? Governor Cuomo has been very clear in challenging us to reinvent the MTA. Reinvent the MTA in the way it approaches and deals with its customers. Um, one point in time in my career, I didn't know what social media meant. I could probably spell it, but didn't know what it meant. Today, the majority of our customers find out about what's happening on our system, hopefully from us, hopefully from us through social media, but if we're void in that area or there's a vacuum, somebody will step in and fill it. So another commuter up and down the line will get on a social media and say, I'm standing at this station, this is what I'm experiencing, what are you experiencing? And the lack of information to fill that void or vacuum is filled up by either misinformation, inaccurate information, that's unacceptable to us. So that's an example of an area that we're being challenged to do a better job, and we will do a better job. Our next capital program needs to be able to deal with a number of things, and I'll go through that relatively quickly right now. It's the single largest MTA capital program. Our first was in 1982. We spent some $115 billion since that time on capital programs. This is by far the largest we have ever had. It's the single largest investment in the infrastructure of the MTA, which is a trillion dollar asset, a trillion dollars. People have said it, but I keep saying it. 11 days to go a million seconds, 22 years to go a billion seconds, 22,000 years to go a trillion seconds. That's the size of the asset. So the importance of contributions, like a record contribution of $8.3 billion from the state, $2.5 billion from the city, is nothing sort of historic. And we have to thank the leadership in Albany and the governor and the mayor for doing that. Um, and it's consistent with what we've done in the past. Uh, one data point is we're a year into a program and haven't got its approval. And some of you say that's where well, we've never been before. But on the other hand, we've got committed to numbers of 8.3 and 2.5. And I'm confident the legislature will come through with ways to be able to fund that. We have to address longstanding problems. You've heard this before. Renew. That's state of good repair. Replace and renew the asset. Enhance. Improve the customer experience. The level and quality of service we provide. And expand. Add additional capacity to the system that is being stretched beyond its limits. We need to be able to, on state of good repair, deliver these projects faster, more efficiently, more economically, go to people who have as their core competencies the ability to shrink the procurement process, do a design, build procurement, have people come in, and make sure we incentivize people to get work done early and penalize them if they get done late. You don't want to go down to a subway station and have to walk through construction uh, for years on end uh, as you utilize the system. Um, New Yorkers are very resilient people. They'll take on all kinds of challenges. Just tell them what you're doing and get out of their way. And that's what they want. Second Avenue Subway, phase one will be open by this year. This will be the first true expansion other than the extension of 7 West, and it's badly needed. Not just for the Upper East Side, but to offload the tremendous capacity problems we have on the Lexington Avenue line, the single most traveled customer line, uh, transit line in the United States today. Uh, we're going to enter into phase two, which extends it north from 96th Street, three more stations going up to 125th Street, once again to offload that burgeoning demand on the Lexington Avenue line and tap all that real estate potential that's up uh, in East Harlem. Um, we also need to provide additional access to what's going, uh, taking place on the east side. In terms of expansion for Long Island Railroad, east side access, which is probably the largest uh, public works project in the country at $10 billion. At the end of 2022, it will, be, it will, for the first time, enable Long Island Railroad customers to a one-seat ride to, the, to Grand Central, uh, provide additional train capacity between Brooklyn and Queens and Long Island, uh, a double track on the main line between Farmingdale and Ronkonkoma, so the reliability of the service on the main line, which is the most heavily traveled line on Long Island Railroad, can be increased, and also provide for reverse peak out there. Same could be said for the third track, which we now call Long Island Railroad Expansion. It is not the project that you heard the agency talk about initially when I was its president 20 years ago and subsequent since then. It's a vastly different project. The underlying purpose is the same. Add 10 miles of a third track in the most heavily traveled stretch of commuter rail track in the country where trains go 80 miles an hour through uh, extremely dense urban areas. 
uh, deal with seven very, very critical grade crossings to improve tra traffic flow and improve safety and provide the ability for the first time for Long Island Railroad to have a re reverse peak commute so they can grow much like Metro North has grown over the years. Um, and in this particular uh, uh, rendition of it, the governor has challenged us to look, approach it totally differently. And so the property takes, the acquisitions of property for the third track in terms of residents, uh, at one time was over 50, we've got it now down to zero. And that's something that you know, we need to be able to do to show the people in Nassau County and the communities that are affected that we're going to be a good neighbor. Uh, bringing Metro North into Penn Station, long, long time ago, you know, first uh, bond issue for Second Avenue subway was 1936. We now will actually have this, you know, the first segment of that operating later this year. But there were promises to uh, Southeast Bronx to be able to have subway service off that. The best way to add four stations in the Bronx right now is by enabling Metro North, once we'll be able to create capacity, because Long Island will go into the basement of Grand Central, that we'll be able to now provide slots for New Haven trains to be able to come into um, Penn Station, which will be very important for Hudson's Yard, reverse peak commute, uh, and actually those four stations in the Bronx, where if you haven't been up there in a while, take a look at all the developments occurring there. It's absolutely phenomenal. Some of the governor's initiatives in terms of enhancing the environment. It takes the environment, the experience that you have every day when you use the MTA system. Um, people, some people can wait. They lose hair. They get long in tooth. They grow hair in their back, all this other stuff, waiting for a project like East Side Access, <laughs> which will be done in 2022. I've never in my entire career been associated with a project that where you're sitting in the room, there's a certain percentage of those people that won't be there when the project gets completed. And that's a little bit frustrating because you always like to know that if something's late or over budget, you can put your hands around somebody's neck and squeeze. But <laughs> if the people that are there aren't going to be there when it's done or you're not going to be there, it's a little bit difficult. So they can't wait for that. They can't wait for some other things. So what can we do to improve the experience of the everyday customer? And that's where the governor has challenged us, reimagining station design. We want to take 31 of the 479 stations, we have 469 stations that we have, most number of stations any system in the world. 71% of the population lives within a half mile of our subway station. But taking 31 of those stations and transforming that experience for those customers. Where do you spend most of your time on our system? In a station and on a train. If you're delayed, but you're convenient and you're comfortable, you're connected, you have the ability to stay in touch with the outside world or your loved ones, time goes a lot faster. If you have nothing to do and it's a dirty, dank, and difficult station, uh, time goes very, very slowly. So we want to be able to have clearer designs, easier to navigate, and deliver these projects much faster. We want to bring in Wi-Fi, charging stations, digital edge, information kiosks, and we're making a commitment to have all 278 underground stations Wi-Fi access enabled by the end of this year. Cell phone service coming to the all underground stations by early next year because of that connectivity. I think every one of us in some point in time over 10, 15 years has experienced the issue of one of your loved ones, your spouse, one of your children, one of your parents. You want to stay in minute by minute contact with them. And when you're underground, you don't have that. And that frustration and antsiness that exists, we're going to try to eliminate. Metro card closer to retirement. If you remember the, the move from tokens, and some people said you never get away from a token, but we're you know, some 20 years removed from it, we need to go to the next level of technology where people can actually use, much like they use other means to buy sporting event tickets, entertainment tickets, um, number of things, we need to be able to move into that. And Long Island and Metro North will have mobile ticketing within six months. Um, we're going to be able to have seamless transactions not only across our system but across the network at large with with other systems being able to use whatever accounts that you have and whatever instruments you have and hopefully speed up the turnstile traffic uh, people don't know this but it's a bit of trivia the old Perry turnstiles that you deposited a token in you would think that they were very slow you could accommodate one and a half customers per second in those turnstiles I dare say it's challenging for us with the technology that we have today, with all the verifications you have to do, you could process people that fast. But for a system like ours, who sees the demands that it sees in a rush hour, it needs to be able to approach that. Countdown clocks, another frustrating thing for me. Because once you whet somebody's appetite with something, they say, why can't you get in on the rest of the system? 
and the manner and method we went about providing countdown clocks for the numbered lines, the IRT in the system, was as an adjunct to a supervisory system that was put in because we couldn't locate trains quickly. We had a terrible train fire in 1990 and two people passed away, but it was an adjunct to that. If we were to follow the same plan to put countdown clocks on the B division or the, the, the lettered lines, it would be you know, 2019, 2020, people, they can't wait that long. That's a countdown clock to a countdown clock. It's like, it's just not going to happen. So we're going to try to accelerate that rollout and provide countdown clocks. And we're going to have some pilots out there to be able to do that. Uh, State-of-the-art buses. The governor and I had a press conference yesterday. Ronnie Hakem was there from uh, New York City Transit. And how can we change that experience? You know, what is a very, very functional bus, very, very high utility bus, not exceptionally attractive bus, but also the connectivity issues. So we want to be able to have Wi-Fi on those buses, charging stations, multimedia screens to let people know where they're at, what they may be seeing along the way, and stay connected, and security cameras. Because I can tell you, early in my career, I had the benefit of working in Chicago Transit Authority. I operated 30 days as a train operator, 30 days as a bus operator. The most lonely time you have as a bus operator is 2.30 in the morning somewhere in a remote part of the city where the only umbilical cord you have to somebody is your radio and a means to be able to get somebody there to help you. Security cameras are a deterrent to crime and abusive behavior on vehicles, and so we're going to be doing that. The capital program is the largest in our history. It is going to enable us to grow as the system grows, enable to bring us into the 21st century. Yes, we do have to do that and embrace the future like we never have before. That's the end of my presentation. Um, that was amazing, and I think everyone in this room appreciates uh, uh, you and, the, and your team's efforts to really modernize the system, uh, remain connected. We were all connected, and uh, uh, having those, uh, you know, uh, battery charging stations, uh, particularly with the iPhones, are, uh, are, are, are critical. Um, and I think you laid it out very clearly. Uh, today, the companies are following where the jobs are. The people want to be here in New York City, and we have to continue to make it easier to, uh, uh, to, to move about uh, the city and uh, in a much more efficient manner. So uh, open it up for questions uh, in the audience. Yes, yes, uh, Dick Anderson. Tom, as you uh, articulated so well, despite the best efforts of the MTA, the private economy in the New York metropolitan region is simply outrunning. Uh, the, uh, the MTA's best efforts, and even uh, the uh, extended capital programs, all the new uh, innovations you're putting forward. What steps uh, would help you the most to be able to keep up with the private economy and not take so long to get, it's like moving a battleship uh, when the economy is moving like a much smaller craft around it. What steps would really help you uh, to be more nimble and, and to be uh, able to respond more, more quickly? First of all, we're a lot better placed than we were 20 years ago. Uh, there has always been a clear understanding by the development world of the nexus between real estate development and public transportation, so that's there. The amount of support we get for our capital program has even grown. Uh, we do have a difficult task now because we have to figure out what are the funding sources for the 8.3 and a 2.5, but the commitments are there, so that's good. Um, and then the other thing we've got to is, is we're much in a much better position, but we continue to need to improve it that the development is either occurring where there are transportation utility available or we have funding in place. So those are examples. So we work very closely with the city, we work really closely with the real estate development community uh, and keep the dialogue going. Um, people get it. I mean, I, I went around and uh, talked to somebody, John Zuccotti, who passed away within the last year, and I think uh, Bill talked about it. He said, development gets it, because what John Zuccotti told me is, is, yes, we need to have transportation systems that are efficient and have good cost structure, but I put developments where transportation is reliable and people know they'll be able to get to work and where they need to. That's where I put my, my development locations. Uh, Sam Rudin, my grandfather, uh, and my cousin Eric's here. Uh, he, his saying is that it was, if I can't get there by subway, I don't want to own it. So uh, we've been transit-oriented and developing for over 75 years, so. Um, another, another question from the audience? I, I, I'll, I'll ask a question, we briefly talked about it before. Um, the mayor just recently announced uh, in his state of the city uh, 
the uh, concept of the uh, BQX uh, for Brooklyn and Queens. Curious to know your thoughts about it and uh, uh, how does that complement and supplement what you guys are doing? Well, one part of connectivity that we can do without, I guess. Um, we haven't seen the details of it, so I'm not going to comment on a detail level, but the issue of others bringing to the fore uh, projects that would enhance transportation in the region and deal with specific needs in an area, which is what the BQX is, you know, we encourage that. Um, and so where development's going to occur along that river and where transportation may not be in a position to be able to, su to support it to the extent that it needs to happen and have that dialogue and have a project out there and bringing third-party finance to be able to fund it, those are all the right kind of things. And that it echoes a little bit with what my answer to Dick was in terms of engagement with the community at large both at a grassroots level from the elected officials, but also with the people who actually are going to be doing the development. So Tom, thank you very, very much. I think everybody was very impressed and uh, excited.